you very much. We're delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to have the honor of moderating such an illustrious panel. Um, so just this week, I had a chance, speaking of illustrious, to speak to the former head of science for India, the equivalent of NIH for India, Samir Brahmachari. Some of you may know him. He's a great speaker. You should come get him for PDF. He uh, is the chief mentor and founder of something called Open Source Drug Discovery. You may have heard about it. Back in 2008, they stood up a project to begin to advance progress on discovering a cure for tuberculosis a disease that affects 1,000 people in India alone who die from it each day. And yet in 40 years, we haven't had an advance in tuberculosis drugs because drugs, diseases of the poor and the indigent are not exactly the priority of people in pharmaceutical companies. So they stood up this project, got a few thousand college students, a couple of scientists, and straggling others, a civic tech, open innovation, crowdsourced project using the internet to annotate the entire scientific literature on tuberculosis. And beginning last year, they've started clinical trials on the first new tuberculosis drug in 40 years. It is a staggering example, I think, of an unexpected and surprising use of the internet, not just for commerce, not simply for business or for entertainment, but for doing public service in new ways, for doing the work that we traditionally associate with government, for doing the work of civ what we often call civic technology, and I hope we'll explain that term. And we have a fabulous panel here to discuss these applications of the internet and of new technology for civic and social good. So I want to bring things a little closer to home to start and ask you, Gail, in your work, first on the city council, and now as Manhattan Borough President, you have been instrumental in advancing legislation and policy around the use of technology to improve the lives of New Yorkers. Not everybody here may be familiar with the open data law and some of the other pieces of legislation that you've worked on. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of this legislation, how it's been faring, um, and what you're proudest of. Well, th first of all, thank you very much. And Beth and I look like the Whitney Museum here, just in terms of our clothes. <laughs> um, for the issues that we uh, passed in the city council include the open data law, which I'll talk about, and also in any agency that has a board, like the Health and Hospitals Corporation, Landmarks Preservation Commission, has to have webcasting. So we did try to open up government by having this transparency available. Now the challenge as borough president and certainly the city council and all of the advocates is making it work. And so that's where the difference is. So the open data law states that every agency, and there are certain benchmarks, has to put their databases in that portal. So that sounds great. But then the challenge is getting the agencies to do it, um, and then also making sure that it's in real time and that it stays updated. Those are the challenges. And even agencies like the police department, which traditionally has not opened up their data, I think we know that, they are trying to do it. But then, of course, there's another part of NYPD that actually does the website. So it's a funny uh, challenge to have to make reality. Open data is terrific. You in the audience and on the panel, you might be able to figure out, peeling back the onion, how to use this data. But we actually have been working with the City University of New York students, training them to work with the 59, or in Manhattan, 12 community boards where they have citizens making decisions about land use and bars and open space and parks and schools, how to use this data. So it can be mapped and it can be useful and it can be available to the public at every committee meeting. Easier said than done. And so the issue for us is, as borough president, how do you take this transparency and make it useful to the public? And that's a challenge. In the schools, for instance, we, they have a lot of data. But where do you need a new school? What kind of buildings are going to mean that there's a lot of new families in the neighborhood? And what kind of ages are those families? So the agencies have some of this information. But believe it or not, or maybe you're not surprised, when we pass the open data bill, guess who was happiest? The administration, because they don't have that data in one place. So the question in 2015 and 2016, and for all of us, is figuring out how that data can get back into the community so that the community can use it to be the best advocates. And that's the challenge, even with the webcasting bill. Believe it or not, some of the buildings in which these agencies reside or are supposed to have um, the uh, webcasting going on, the Department of Technology in the city, known as Do It, doesn't allow us because they say that it takes up too much bandwidth to do the streaming. 
<laughs> so now we, they say, oh, go get a, a carrier. Well, why should we have to pay a carrier, Time Warner or somebody else, Cablevision, to produce what should be available to the public? So these are the issues that you deal with in, in reality. So let me, I'm going to keep things moving forward along the panel and try to make this as much of a conversation as possible. So somebody who's very grounded in reality, real constituents <laughs> as well, serves on the city council. But in addition to be a politician, you are also a techie yourself, a builder, a doer, a total renaissance man, like, like Andrew to your left. So I want to ask you, tell us about the reality on the ground as you know it. What have you been up to? Uh, and what do you think about Gail's statements that there is a big distance between the policy and the, prog and the practical progress on the ground? Well, first, uh, Beth, thank you for moderating the uh, panel. Thank you to Internet Week for having us this year. Uh, glad to be here with uh, Gail and Andrew. Uh, something most of you are used to from me by now is I need you to hold up your phones, please. Uh, I mean it. Uh, what do we have to do? You can tweet all of us. Uh, our Twitter names are on that panel oh. to <laughs> our right, your left. Uh, and let's have a conversation. The way I know you're listening is that you're tweeting me. Uh, best case scenario is we hear you. Uh, worst is you get a retweet. Uh, but I think it's <laughs> worth engaging in the conversation. So I'm uh, Council Member Ben Kalos. Uh, I'm an attorney, but I got a little bit bored with law, so I became an, a free and open source software developer. Uh, so now we actually have a techie in government. And uh, before I got into government, I was a huge fan and continue to be a big fan of Gail Brewer. Uh, she passed Open Data and now as borough president, she's doing a lot to modernize the community boards, which is where I got my start. It's a great way to get involved. But uh, once I got elected, I wanted to hit the ground running. So the first thing we did is uh, opened up our legislation. So uh, as part of the new rules reforms that I was able to help write, we required that there be an open technology plan. So we recently announced City Council 2.0. And starting this July, we'll have an open API around our legislation. And that's an opportunity to take our legislative information and turn it into something usable, something that constituents might actually care about. Uh, we were also able to uh, take something called the city record. Has anyone ever heard of the city record in the audience? Uh, I see five hands, uh, six, seven. <laughs> Uh, it is the most important newspaper you've never heard of and never read. It tells you about everything happening in the city, when the city wants to rezone your single family home into a commercial district. That's how they tell you. They put it in the city record, and the city record gets circulated to other people in government. Uh, for hitchhikers fans, that's the equivalent of leaving it on file at Alpha Centauri. Uh, so we passed a law called City Record Online. Uh, the anniversary is coming right up, and hopefully you'll be able to have a notification standard around what the government is doing. And uh, in that, we need your support to make that information available to people online or on their phones. Uh, we also passed a law called uh, the Law Online, uh, which ch changes things a little bit away from the LexisNexis Westlaw model where they charge for law and actually puts it out there. And so in that, we have an opportunity uh, because we are put out an RFP. So anyone here from a company, be it uh, a free and open source developer or private otherwise, you have an opportunity to get paid by New York City. And in fact, the city has millions, if not billions of dollars that it's offering in technology contract every single day. And uh, you have an opportunity to bid on it and earn income from the city in that way. So whether it's civic partnership around the city record or an actual financial partnership through the law, uh, we have a chance to really start changing government. And uh, like the borough president was saying, it's all about the implementation and we have a real opportunity here to work together on improving government so that we actually get the government that we want. Right. Awesome. And I want to echo Ben's comments that uh, with the small time we have remaining, uh, if you do tweet to me, I'm following it. I see lots of uh, fan call outs here, but we also want some provocative questions with the time that we have. So Andrew, you have been doing this, doing this civic tech thing as long as anybody has. And for those who haven't visited Civic Hall yet, one of the great new cultural institutions in Manhattan, move over Lincoln Center. <laughs> now Civic Hall is the new, uh, the new happening place to be. You are therefore a convener. You are on the ground listening to all the voices in this space. I'm eager to hear what are you hearing? What's exciting to you on this question of the so, latest in civic tech? Th thank you, Beth. And it's a pleasure to be on a, pa on a tech panel where at least half the panelists are women. <laughs> um, it's also a pleasure to be on a panel with two elected officials who actually understand how the internet works. 
and are so focused on leveraging the power of technology to make uh, our democracy and citizenry work better. And I, uh, listening to both of you, I have a perspective which I want to add, which is that it's fantastic that government is now waking up and delivering more open data for the public to use. And you gave a bunch of great examples, Ben and Gail, your leadership in helping New York be a leader in this. But the real opportunity is not that we need more uh, civic apps. We need apps to be more civic. And it's not just when government is taking its data and making it available, but citizens themselves collecting this data and also making it open and available for people to use in innovative ways so that we can move from an era of e-government to we-government, where the relationship between citizens and their elected officials and their neighborhoods and their communities is more connected through these technologies in ways that support things that can happen even without government assistance. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a fantastic project being uh, sort of worked on a little bit at Civic Hall, which is called Organize, which is to create a national database of organ donors because there is no such thing. There are 50 states that have separate databases and they don't talk to each other. Um, the federal government's not going to spend the money on it, so technologists are able to now pull together that information and build a new platform to save more lives. Or Crisis Text Line, which is a project out of Do Something which is to build a national uh, platform for teenagers who are in trouble, suicidal, depressed, being bullied, uh, have food disorders or other, or are homeless or, or, or um, depressed, to be able to text and be able to um, get help in an immediate way. But the innovation is, is that all those texts are available for the next caseworker to see so they can see the history of the, of the young person's problem. And then the crisis text line collects all that data by keywords and is able to parse that data in a way that helps public policy uh, makers understand where support needs to go for more, to alleviate suicide or to help people in particular parts of the country because none of that data had been collected before. This is where private activity married with government data can actually make a big difference. So let me just work our way backwards again to ask you the example that I started with and the one that you gave are both more civic than governmental, if you will. They depend a little bit on a lever from government, but it's about action taking place from the outside in. Do you think that's where the future's at? Yeah, I, and then I want to hear from the politicians about <laughs> whether they think it's going to be more civic or more institutional and where that boundary is shifting. Please. Well, I, I just want to just, uh, in 10 seconds, just say, I think the opportunity is where government can help, great. But there's great tools now and great abilities and great networks for people to actually build an entirely new civic fabric where government can be a partner, but doesn't necessarily have to be present in order for an innovation to happen. So Gail, what do you think? Well, I agree with that, but I also want to say that government has to keep their databases up to date, and they also have to make them in real time, and they obviously shouldn't be in PDF. You have to be able to manipulate you know, the 311 data with the local you know, uh, street pothole issues from the neighborhood. So government uh, has to, and I think that's what our role is a little bit, make sure that their databases and their information is something that the we government can then take and use. I mean, I think that at NYC, uh, at New York Tech, Tech Meetup, which is also another Andrew Roche brainchild. There are so many. No, no, that wasn't my brainchild. <laughs> um, the issue is uh, the heat, the group that came up with the notion that they could put an actual uh, device in the apartment of people who do not have heat in heat New Yorkers. Seat. Heat right. seat. And then, instead of having to copy all this information down and take it to court, it's available online in real time. But they took the data from NYC government. So that's an example where people's uh, heat uh, problems hopefully can be addressed more efficiently by the city of New York and the inspectors, and then people get heat in their apartments. I thought that was a great public-private partnership. But it took the Department of Buildings and HPD making sure that their information is current so that the information can then be uh, worked on by the, by the tenant and the owner. So, so so government has to be up to date, and I have to say that is not 100% true right now. So let's, Ben, let's come to a function that is squarely governmental. We're not going to outsource legislation, the legislative process entirely. So what's the, where does this kind of co-creation boundary, how is the internet shifting, what the private sector can do, what the public sector can do, and what this sort of new civic uh, middle space looks like? How can the folks in this audience actually make a difference in what you do, which is such a squarely governmental function? So we get the government we deserve. 
Uh, so the more active people <laughs> are, more promise, yeah. <laughs> it, it, both. Uh, so where you have people who are disengaged, they may not have elected officials who will be as responsive, but when people are engaged and they have an elected official who is responsive, and Gail has been a model, and I, I try to live up to her model, and it's, it's tough, I have to tell you. Uh, <laughs> she does constituent service in person. She gives out her, her everything. Um, and so the key piece here is that you and the audience need to demand more from your government, and the government needs to be more open. So legislation typically is something that you see elected officials doing on their own, and that's something I actually am trying to change. So my legislation is actually posted on bencalos.com, it's posted on GitHub, it's posted on democracy.os, it's posted on Madison, where anyone can actually comment on the legislation, and for the programmers out there, you can actually uh, pull my legislation, modify it, push it back onto my GitHub repo, and make changes. And so um, I, I think I'm, I'm in between uh, Gail and Andrew in both areas, I think it's up to government to make sure that we make the information available in an open API and make sure it's updated. But I'm also committed to making sure we support the civic community. So I, I actually was a coach at GovLab uh, on a course on civic technology, and I worked with uh, one particular group called uh, Commune.io around taking this data, the city record that we're going to be putting online, and trying to build an app around it. So I think we need to have more of a partnership between government and the uh, private sector, whether it's civic technologists at nonprofits or for-profits to make sure that we're giving them the data that they need to do something with it and uh, that we're just being responsive. So the city record group, we have a city record working group based out of Beta NYC where people are actually requesting specific types of data in certain formats. And so we actually have a chance to work together to give you the government you actually want. So Andrew, let me ask you, because you have been a leader in really convening people in this space is what incentives can we create to get more people in engaged and involved? So obviously, the exhortation to say you get the government you deserve is going to get a lot of people, the people who are at Civic Hall now, to stay and do the great work that they're doing. How do you get more people in the door, whether it's at Civic Hall, reading the Civicist, participating in personal democracy forum, or doing all the things well, that we're talking about? I mean, you know, 10 years ago, you know, when I was running for public advocate, um, I used to have a line that said, politicians don't know the difference between a server and a waiter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that's not as, not as much of a, of a funny line anymore, but there are more politicians now who understand the potential of technology to change their relationship to citizens. And so I guess what I, what I see is, is that as, as more politicians are using the technology and more funding starts coming from foundations who are also recognizing this opportunity. So let me name a couple. Ford Foundation, Omidyar Network, the Knight Foundation, uh, the Case Foundation, and Sloan are starting to fund civic projects to allow innovators who want to work with government data to build new services and new platforms. We need that funding to match up with the people that we're talking about, with the politicians who are making that data available so that these new innovations can happen and we can redefine the civic ecosystem, not just about voting, not just about where the buses are, when, when the buses are arriving, but more about de developing an entirely new uh, fabric of, of communication between citizens, their communities, and the decisions that they're making about their lives. Gail, ways to get more people engaged. One of the places people are most engaged, obviously, is parents in the lives of their children in schools. Yep. That seems to be one of the really hard nuts to crack. There's tech in the classrooms, obviously, but how can we bring, where, what are the lessons of this for uh, the situation that we're facing in terms of improving education in our schools? Well, I think here? there's twofold. Taking a line from Andrew Roche, you know. One of them is that when you're in school, you're, not, you're in the classroom a lot. You're not necessarily on the computer a lot, but you need to have almost a 24-7 ability to use your device to get information. And that is not true now. So what you have in the school is you have, depending on the quality of the school, you have a slow or somewhat fast incoming uh, broadband so that you can have all of the five high schools in that building able to access the information, is that true or not? And we need that kind of an assessment. Because believe it or not, that is often a very slow process, maybe even slower than what we are here today at the Internet Society. That has to change. And the second issue is you need to have home and school accessible. And in a community of 
New Yorkers where average income is pretty low in the city of New York in a lot of communities, people don't have devices, a PC at home. And so, and the libraries are not open the hours that I would like to see open. So the fact of the matter is, what kind of device is that family using and what kind of access do they have 24-7? That's something that they can do the homework on, that they can uh, get information on and how they can be the best possible student. Seems like maybe in this audience a no-brainer, but that is not, not, is not reality. And we don't have a municipal Wi-Fi in the whole city. So I think one of the issues is looking at the city and the schools as something that's one, and how do we make it available to the 1.2 million students? It's not, that's what I would like to see more of. The E-rate, which comes from the federal government, is only available in the classroom, and often there's a computer lab, or sometimes there's not a computer lab, and then you have the teachers that need a lot of training in what some of us are talking about today. Some of the younger teachers have it, some of the older ones don't, and you don't necessarily have a constant presence of a, a computer teacher or computer science in that school. And yet, of course, what is everybody talking about? You heard from the earlier panel, the jobs that are available and that disconnect. Now, some schools, this is happening. I was one at a school the other day, uh, one of the urban assembly media schools on 49th Street, and I think they're doing it all, but that is not, not across mm -hmm. the board. So I think in summary, you gotta think about what's available in coming to that school. You gotta think about teacher training, and then you have to do the 24-7 the thinking that kids have to be able to get their homework and all other kinds of resources on a constant basis, and what is the device that does that? So very quickly, Andrew, five years from now, or 10 years from now, your choice, how does government look different because of the net? How does the net look different because of government? Uh, 10 years from now, there'll be something called the Public, Public Online Information Act, which means that anywhere in existing law or regulation where a piece of information is required to be public, it will no longer be considered public unless it's machine readable and searchable online. And I think Ben Kalos is actually thinking about introducing that bill in New York. It, it's introduced. Um, and I, I guess for, for my part, it's you look at your phone, no matter where you are on the planet, it tells you what governance you're ruled by and you'll be able to just interact with government regardless of it. It would be seamless, just like shopping at Amazon. Gail, 10 years from now. Well, I like mom and pop stores in New York City. I just want to say that. Um, I think 10 years, from, <laughs> 10 years from now, you'll be able, you still have to, people have to be trained to use this. I want to make sure that that training, whether it's teachers, community board, I want to be able to have them know how to use all this data, because I know that we have it all, but my goal would be to have enough training so that they know how to use it. Maybe in 10 years that will be true, but I want to make sure it's there. Well, we're uh, sadly out of time. We could obviously spend hours and not days uh, continuing this conversation. And I want to thank our panel uh, for what has been tremendously both uh, uh, enriching and rewarding. And I think we've managed in a, short, in a short amount of time to get out a lot of very big ideas. I want to thank you for attending and those people online for listening and watching. And uh, thank you to Internet. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. You were fabulous, Beth. Yeah.